Good morning, church. Welcome to worship today. It's a great day. Why? Because any day in which we are able to gather together in worship of God is a great day. We're blessed with ministry of word and sacrament and with beautiful music. So, feel so blessed to have choir leadership and other music that's offered here this morning, even with staff away. So welcome to church today. If this is your first time, whether in person, like it is for my mom who's visiting, or if this is your first time worshiping virtually with us, this is a house of prayer for all people. And so we welcome you here to Abington Presbyterian Church. Because we seek for this to be a house of prayer for all people, we have worked hard to protect all of God's children in worship throughout this pandemic. And so as you know, we've had various guidelines in place uh, for indoor worship and for outdoor worship. We're happy to have updated our, uh, our, our, our policies recently, which allow for people who are worshiping in person to remove their masks if they so choose once they are in their pews for worship. Um, we'll ask that you put your mask back on when we sing. You are welcome to sing throughout the service now, but we ask that you would put your mask back on during those hymns, uh, since singing is a, high, a higher risk activity. So with all of that uh, being said, uh, I do have a couple, two more announcements that I would like to share with all of you. Uh, we know that, the summer, that summer soaker is coming up. We know that I like to talk a lot of trash about the summer soaker. Uh, about winning the race, about beating Justin File, all these things. Um, whatever happens, though, this is for charity. No need to be competitive. If you are uh, able to participate in the Summer Soaker, we invite you to head over to the website to register uh, to come in person. There's information on our website. You can go to runtheday.com uh, to register and get more information. Um, last summer, it had to be all virtual. This summer, it, it is in person. It's also virtual, though. If you think that that is still the best way for you to participate, we welcome that. Uh, we welcome you to do so virtually, um, and we invite you to head over to the website for more information. And finally, we are hosting our, uh, uh, a blood drive here at the church on July 10th. That information is in your bulletin material, so if you're able to participate in uh, the ministry of giving blood, we invite that um, for, uh, for church coming up. And along those lines, we do have a moment for mission um, from Sam, who will provide better details about our blood drive. Hello and good morning, everyone. I am Sam Thomas, and I'm one of the youth deacons this year. And I have a few questions for you. Do you like helping people? More importantly, are you able to give blood? Because if so, I have a great opportunity for you. The deacons have a partnership with the Red, American Red Cross to hold blood drives each year. And one of these blood drives, as Aaron said, is coming up in just two weeks on Saturday, July 10th. It's from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And if you can, blood is a great way to help. Every two seconds, somebody is in need of blood, be it from receiving treatment for cancer or a blood uh, disorder, undergoing transplants or surgeries, or uh, complications in pregnancies. There's always a demand for blood, and with just an hour from your day, you could save up to three lives with your blood. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle File, and I have a moment for mission about a new group at APC. Um, I would just like you to know I'm an elder, a member of session. I'm the chair for Christian Ed, and June is a fabulous month. It's the start of summer. It's the 21-year anniversary of when Justin and I joined APC. And it's Pride Month, which is an awesome time for us to kick off the work of a new group that we call APC Pride. You may have heard about our group if you've read the emails from the pastors or um, the bulletin. You may have seen some information, but I came to the 9 a.m. service. I'm here for 11 a.m. and talking to all of you online just to make sure you've heard about our group because we know not everybody is active on social media or reading every bit of information we send electronically. So here I am, and I brought a little visual to show you. We have a great logo for our group, and I know it's hard to see online, so I brought a bigger version. 
It's uh, APC Pride, a house of prayer for all people, and it incorporates the colors of the pride flag. I really encourage everyone to do their own research and find out what every color in the pride flag stands for. A little trivia. We do have some colors in the inclusive pride flag that started here in Philadelphia um, to include elements of racial diversity, which are really important in all of our community, but especially in the LGBTQ community. So there, we do have a Facebook group and an uh, uh, Instagram group for the people who are younger, who <laughs> aren't quite on Facebook as much, but we know a lot of you aren't on either of those platforms. So if you're interested in learning more about the group, please reach out to me, Michelle File. Information's in the bulletin and the email. But um, we're interested in doing work moving forward, having discussion groups, having some pride events perhaps, and you'll be hearing more about those opportunities as we move forward. But um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, LGBTQ individuals have said that even a small rainbow sends a strong signal of welcome and acceptance and love. And we want to make sure that um, we send that message clearly from APC. We've been silent. We haven't talked much about LGBTQ concerns, except a couple years ago when we did have a two-part series um, that was led by Kirby and Susan Weber on coming to a scriptural understanding of LGBTQ concerns. So we want to have a reprise of that event and have some more book clubs and discussion groups moving forward. So please reach out to me if you're in interested in any of that work. But um, when we're silent about these issues, it can cause fear and anxiety. And we know that 50% of those who identify as LGBTQ contemplate or attempt suicide. And because of that, we have decided that our church is going to make a collection on behalf of the congregation and APC Pride to donate to the Trevor Project. It's a national organization that is the leading group that provides crisis intervention and tools to help prevent suicide in LGBTQ youth. So if you'd like to donate over the summer, we'll be collecting all summer long. Um, just make a note of the Trevor Project in your donation online or on your check, and uh, we welcome your participation and support. Thank you. I invite you to stand with me in body or spirit as we call ourselves to worship this day. Out of every depth we cry out to the living God. Hear our voices, O Lord. We wait, wait for, for you and hope in your word. word. Our souls wait for the Lord our God as one who watches for the morning. We hope in the Lord, whose steadfast love redeems us in power. Look upon us with favor. Do not to turn to us in anger, O God. We know that the joy of the Lord comes in the morning. Turn our mourning into dancing and our sorrow into joy.
Surrounded by the steadfast love of God, we gain courage to examine our lives and our relationships. Together we confess the sin that cuts us off from our cre creator and separates us from one another. Let us confess our sins in unison. Holy and merciful God, we have once again strayed from your paths of righteousness. Even though our hearts tells us one thing, our minds often imagine other ways to satisfy our needs. We create suffering, encourage wakefulness, and embrace greed. Help us out of the miry clay, O Lord, and forgive us for our selfish ways. We need the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ once again. Friends, the grace of God reaches into the darkest corners of our spirits. Receive and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. with one another. We have been sharing the peace using sign, but now it's okay for you to say the peace of Christ be with you without using the sign. So whichever way you want to do it is fine with us. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ. The peace of Christ, Jake. Okay, it's my turn today to do the children's message. You know that Mrs. Sal and Mr. Sal are away on vacation and also doing uh, special work. So I was the one nominated to do the children's message this morning. And of course, it's been a while since I've taught little children. So um, I don't know if any little children would wanna come up or if you prefer to stay in your seats. Let me know if you'd rather stay in your seats, it's okay. I think they prefer to stay in their seats. Anyway, um, today's message, one of them, comes from the Book of Lamentations, and it talks about God's steadfast love. You don't have, I'm gonna come down here to you. It talks about God's stead, steadfast love. And I was saying to myself, I think I need to know what steadfast means. I, I never heard of steadfast too much. I never hear too many people talking about steadfast. So I was like, what does steadfast mean? And it came to me that when we're in school and we use magic markers and we write, 
things with our magic marker, it stays forever. And when we go to camp, especially overnight camp, and we're all packing up our things, our parents use mag magic markers, the permanent kind, to put our names on our pajamas and underwear, because everybody's stuff looks the same. So that way, we know that ours is, belongs to us because our name is on it, it's permanent. So steadfast is the same as saying permanent. It means that if you even use Tide or Cheer or whatever, it's not going to disappear. So it's steadfast. It's forever. It's permanent. So steadfast love, what does that mean? OK, so God loves us, but he loves us in a steadfast way, a permanent way. So one time, a mother asked her three-year-old, how much do you love me? And he looked, he says, well, mommy, I love you that much. She was like, OK, that's pretty big. Uh, she says, but I love you this much. And he was like, well, I can do that. I love you this much, too. And then she says, but you know what? God loves us even more. And she took him outside, and he looked up to the sky, and she said, look at the sky. Look how big it is and how enormous it goes from one spot to another and on and on and on. That's how much God loves us. And she said, you know, when we go to the ocean and we sit on a beach and you look at the water, you can't figure out the beginning or the end. As far as your eye can see both ways, that's how much God loves us. And how deep the ocean is, that's how much God loves us. As much as a missile can go up into the sky, or as far as it can go, that's how much God loves us. And that's called steadfast love. That's the love that lasts forever. And that's the love that we can always depend on because God loves us so much. Everybody understand that? My two little ladies back there, you understand that? All right, all right. So let us pray. God, we just thank you this morning for your steadfast love. We thank you that no matter where we are, what we're going through, how things get difficult or we can't seem to handle it, you are there with us and you, oh God, love us. You love us, you said, forever. And we're so grateful and so thankful for that. And we just give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our prayer of illumination this morning. O oh Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and in love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. This morning, I will be reading from the Book of Lamentations, verses 3 through 22. I mean, chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. Uh -uh. Chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. I'm, I'm, see, see, the thing is, this, this book, Lamentations, this really got me. First of all, I couldn't even find it. I said, why would Aaron pick Lamentation? Where is it? I flipped through the front, flipped through the back. I said, is the book really a but true book? I said, wait a minute now, I think this is terrible. I gotta go to the front of the book and figure out what page it starts on. That's really a book. It's after Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. He cried about everything. He cried about Jerusalem. He cried about the sins of the people. 
He really loved uh, God's people, but he weeped and he cried a lot. But then Lamentations is even more about being sorry and crying. So I said, Lord, thank you for letting me know that Lamentations is behind Jeremiah and probably Jeremiah wrote it. So I'm just going to start reading the part that Aaron picked out. He picked out the good part. He picked out the part where the people after they sinned and were bad and did all things they shouldn't do, he picked out the part where the people came to the point where they said, God is good. He got to the, I like that part. When you talk about how good God is, most of us do. But God also sees what we don't do that's good. And we need to remember that. But I'm reading from the good part. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it. To put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope. To give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How am I supposed to focus on what I'm trying to do? I'm glad that we are in the good spot of limitations right now because we're not going to stay there. But first, our second reading for today comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. This is when Paul pauses in his letter to try to tell the Corinthians about giving money. And the way that Paul tries to write this, I think that we can all relate when you have to try to talk to someone about something serious through text or email, and you think, I wish I could just be there with them, right? Um, I think Paul wished that he could be there with the Corinthians as he tried to talk to them about this sensitive subject. Now, as you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so also we want you to excel in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. But now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, The gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, The one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the history of the nation of Israel, the book of Lamentations was composed as a witness to the profound destruction that took place in the 6th century BCE. 
The Old Testament passage that Pastor Jade read is a small window of hope and consolation in the midst of an otherwise deeply intimate account of Jerusalem's demise. Lamentations was written by and for a people who had survived an unimaginable trauma with personal, political, social, and theological dimensions. What if everything that you relied on for your security, comfort, identity, your sense of God's presence, and hope in the future simply vanished overnight? For the people of Jerusalem in 587 BCE, who watched the Babylonians smash the walls of their nation, burn down their temple, knock down their houses in the city, and execute the Davidic royal family, the world seemed to lose all sense of order and coherence. Life suddenly felt chaotic, brutal, meaningless, and hopeless. These emotions and the questions that arose from the traumatic destruction of Jerusalem are reflected in the Book of Lamentations. And then 500 years later, Paul writes to his church asking for money. Now, I'm not sure what's more American here, that the lectionary text from Lamentations avoids any of the actual lament, or that the rose-colored reading is paired with Paul's teaching to the Corinthians about their tithes and offerings. But alas, the Spirit leads us to contend with the sorrow. A couple of books back from Lamentations, 2 Samuel chapter 1 is an alternate reading in the lectionary for this week. David has just lost both Saul and his companion Jonathan. He unleashes a tidal wave of grief and lament that is raw and painful. The NRSV translates the beginning of this passage rather poorly, saying that David intoned a lamentation. I mean, really? Who intones their grief? The Hebrew language invites us to go deeper. Let's not be afraid to go with it. Here's David's guttural chant of lamentation. You mountains, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson, in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, even surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen how the weapons of war perished. The mighty here in David's lament refers to the fact that Saul was a king and Jonathan was a friend with a giant spirit and a strong nature. Not a few scholars in the history of biblical studies have wondered if Jonathan and David weren't more than just friends. All around him, David's mighty ones had fallen. The created order had been turned upside down. They weren't supposed to die. Saul and Jonathan were permanent fixtures in David's life, long-standing monuments like the ancient homes of Jerusalem that were destroyed by an otherworldly army, like tall buildings that had been blown apart by rocket-propelled grenades. Their deaths were tragic, not just because of how close they were to David, but because their lives were cut short with so much potential left unrealized. Israel laments for the destruction of her people. David laments the loss of his soulmates. And generations later, yet another son in David's lineage had his life snuffed out by a foreign power, 
with Jesus, the king of the Jews who had come to save Israel after generations of oppression, was crucified after an illegal trial, his mother and followers watching from afar. And then, about 40 years after Jesus' death, the second temple of Judaism was destroyed with not another to ever be built by the Roman army under Titus. More lament, more grief, and still I invite us to sit with it. Now, I was picking on Americans earlier, but in all serious, seriousness, we aren't very good at grief and lament. In general, Christian culture focuses on the joy of the resurrection, the insistence of new life in the face of death, so much so that we may be reluctant to linger in our grief. How do we share in grief together? What communal practices help us to navigate and even name the deep waters of lament? Kathleen O'Connor, who is an Old Testament scholar at Columbia Seminary, helps us. She teaches about the interrelatedness between trauma and disaster and biblical studies. And she agrees with me about our difficulty with grief. That's why I'm mentioning her. She agrees with me. She says that the Book of Lamentations offers us something really unique, something she calls a theology of witness to suffering. In contemporary American culture, the expression of pain and suffering is often seen as embarrassing, weak, and even tacky. If something is wrong, then many of us want to know how to fix it so that we can forget about it. Asking someone else to hear about our pain is considered selfish and even cringy. We should grin and bear the pain, especially in Christian communities where the triumph of Christ's resurrection often serves as some kind of trump card to force people to rejoice, or the call of Christ to carry our crosses serves to halt any conversation about pain or suffering. But Lamentations asks us to do the opposite, to sit with our grief either ours or someone else's, and give ourselves time to feel its texture, its weight, and its shape. But there are two deficiencies that I think we face that prevent us from grieving and lamenting in the ways that we find so many people in the Bible doing. The first, the first reason why it's hard for us to sit with grief is that it is chaotic, and we love nothing more but to have control. And I'm not even talking about unreasonable control. We know that we can't control the weather or the way people drive. But there are some aspects of our lives that we have a hard time accepting a lack of control. And when we are with people who are grieving, when we are faced with the prospect of hearing the voices of lament, it is control that we want, sometimes even more than the person doing the suffering. We come into the situation with gusto and the best of intentions, but when we realize that we have no control over the circumstance, we want to turn our way, our eyes away. We want to avert our gaze. People turning away is exactly what the prophet was wailing against when he wrote Lamentations. Not in our passage, the window of hope, but at the beginning of the book, Chapter 1, when the author repeatedly pleads with the Lord, saying, Look, look on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. Look, look and consider, for I am despised. Look around and see, is any suffering like mine? We aren't good at lament and grief with others because we aren't good at fixing our gaze upon the suffering when there's nothing we can do about it. And so you know what we want to do when we can't do anything about it and when we don't want to look at it. We want to give it money. And the hard part is that giving money in and of itself is not wrong. Sometimes it's a really good thing to do. Not every Corinthian could travel around the Mediterranean with Paul and Timothy not every Abingtonian can establish urban ministries or fight hunger full-time or travel the world for the gospel. And so the, the Apostle Paul agrees with me. 
which again is why I'm mentioning him. But in our reading from 2 Corinthians, he teaches the church about faithful giving. And certainly I'm not one to stand in the way of faithful giving. But isn't it possible that sometimes we give money because we feel guilty about looking away from the problem? We give money to the grief while at the same time looking away from it. We give money without ever having to sit down with those who are lamenting. And I'm not sure that that's what Paul had in mind. Sure, maybe Paul didn't care what the Corinthians did with their lives as long as they dropped the cash in the offering plate, but I suspect not. After all, he spends the vast majority of his time in writing to them, teaching them about how to live. But if our money is part of looking away, then we need to practice better habits of grief and lament. The second reason why it's hard for us to witness to lament is that witnessing involves us sitting still, not moving, not acting. A witness sits in the stand and testifies to what she has heard and seen. She tells the truth and doesn't get up to run away. A witness to lament doesn't feel compelled to get up and do something right away because that would take her away from the pain that she's witnessing to. Why do we always want to do something about the grief that we are invited to witness? We hear about an injustice, the suffering of another or any kind of calamity, and our response is to mobilize, to move, to act, to do something, to run, to march. And like giving money, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these things. Most of the things that we want to do in response to someone's grief are good and right. But their rightness is exactly what makes our addiction to them so hard to see. David couldn't do anything about the deaths of Saul and Jonathan. Jeremiah the prophet couldn't do anything about the utter desolation of Israel witnessed by her children. Nothing could be done. And yet they lamented wanting nothing more than for someone, anyone, to listen and to sit with them. In recent years, in my experience with anti-racism work, somewhat of a tide has shifted that I have heard from black leaders and other people of color. They've begun to say that the thing they want the most from white people is for them to listen, to sit with stories of loss, and to hear their lament, even if they feel discomfort. They don't necessarily want the anger of white people right away, which usually leads us to get up and shout. There is a place for all of our anger and all of our shouting in the face of systemic injustice, but we have to remember that if we are shouting, we are not listening. And so I have appreciated the work of our church's anti-racism team over the past year. I deeply empathize with the team's strong desire to act on behalf of people of color in our community and all victims of injustice. At the same time, the group has decided that our congregation could benefit greatly from a program of dialogue and listening held here at the church. Now, it's in its nascent development, but the idea is to invite folks to our church on the premise that it is important for people to listen and hear each other's stories. And those stories won't be easy to sit with. Many of them will be difficult. People who come and choose to listen will be committing to sit with grief and the lament that is shared. Just three questions that are included. What acts of of injustice have most affected you? We want to hear. How have challenges of movement and travel shaped who you are today? Where do you feel most powerless and powerful, and why? These are the stories that need to be told, and we are a church that wants to listen. But I get it, we may wonder what the point is. What is the point of sitting and listening if something can be done? And so I'm not suggesting that we stand in the way of righting wrongs. I welcome the forces of good that are embodied by capable partners in advocacy and ministry. Maybe that's why Lamentations 3 is good for us to hear today, because there's always hope. 
the Lord will have compassion according to his steadfast love. Without forgetting God's faithfulness, one pastor acknowledges that chapters 4 and 5 of Lamentations return us to remembering the trauma. He suggests that chapter 3 did not solve the problem of the writer or remove the need to voice the grief. The narrative of the trauma still demanded to be told and demands to be retold. Most strikingly, the book of Lamentations closes with a startling series of questions. Why have you forgotten completely? Why have you forsaken us these many days? The poet asks God for restoration, but ends the book with a sobering thought. Perhaps God has utterly rejected the people, and there is no more hope. This is right there in the scriptures. Are we still willing to sit and listen? Last week, I pointed out how important it was for Paul to have such good and faithful companions around him during his suffering, and how we can better endure our own pain by investing in good relationships. This is what we have to be able to accept if we want to have the courage to sit and listen to the lament of the afflicted, which is that sitting with them will always be its own reward. Sitting with others in their grief and lament will not gain us anything. We won't be paid over time. There are no special places in heaven for those who are willing to sit and fix their gaze upon the destruction and turmoil. There are no fancier jewels, no better crowns for people who are willing to hear the lament. Instead, when we sit and listen, the space that is created in our hearts, that initially holds the pain of what we witness, will be filled by the promises we find in chapter 3. When people tell their stories, when they release the guttural chant of lamentation in the presence of those who are willing to hear, the void that is testified to will be filled not by us, but by the God whom the weeping prophet points to, even in the midst of his profound grief. The steadfast love of the Lord, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, to give one's cheek to the smiter, and be filled with insults. But the Lord will not reject forever. These are my laments. Amen. Well, after going through that together, I invite us to stand and let us be comforted by the voices of one another that we hear reading this affirmation of faith that comes from a brief statement of faith. Join with me. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Let us pray. We come to you in humility and exaltation, 
We express our love to you in words that are inadequate in describing how much you mean to us. We are in awe of your power, glory, and majesty. We are grateful for your steadfast love and mercy toward us. Even when we fall short of your expectation, you continue to forgive us, love us, and encourage us to move in closer relationship to you. Your faith in us never ceases. Yet you are the one with great faithfulness. Even when we can't see, you tell us to wait on the Lord. Wait in hope for the salvation and compassion of the Lord. Your compassion toward us is great. For our good, Jesus, who was rich in God's kingdom, became poor, that we might become rich. Teach us, O oh God, how to become rich in compassion, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, and sharing our abundance. Let us be your ambassadors of justice, peace, and love. Teach us how to move according to the measure of fullness you have given us. We thank you for your steadfast love and mercies that never ceases. Lord, we ask you to be with the loved ones who suffered loss of family or friends in the condo collapse in Miami. God, we ask you to comfort them, show them your love and peace. Lord, we ask you to touch all those who are suffering from the loss of a loved one. Touch those who are sick and suffering from all kinds of diseases. Touch those who are suffering from food insecurities, joblessness, and homelessness. Touch those who are suffering from institutional discrimination. We ask for healing and deliverance. We pray, O oh God, for your blessing and covering over the Presbyterian Church USA, Abington Presbyterian Church, and the church worldwide. We pray in the name of the head of the church, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The offering sentence that I selected this morning comes from Matthew 25:40 which says, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it for me. In the tradition of offertory sentences at Abington, I come to just thank you for all that you have been doing throughout the pandemic, even now, how you've given and, and reached deep in your pockets and just supported the ministry here we are so grateful and thank you so much um, because the church is still standing, bills are getting paid, things are getting done, ministries are, are working, and, and it's just, it, it, in the, in the, you would think that through the pandemic there would be less giving and instead there's more giving. And so we're really grateful for that. Um, when you leave, you can, put your offering in the basket, or you can use the online portal on the website, or you can send your offering through the mail. Whatever you do, make sure you put your uh, number on the envelope and indicate how you want your offering to be used. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your big hearts. We appreciate it, and God bless you.
are worshiping with us in person today, we invite you to uh, be seated after the benediction, enjoy the prelude, and be dismissed by one of our ushers. You're welcome to visit and fellowship with one another outside in the parking lot. Friends, turn your lament into joy. Do you know why? Because after two weeks, I don't preach again for another several weeks. <laughs> so you get a break. Turn your lament into joy because we know that God will not forget us, but will turn God's face toward us and lavish God's favor upon us. So if you find yourself in the position to witness to lament and suffering, I invite you to take heart and sit and listen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forever. Amen.